Kelly Vaughn, and this is Inside Indie. They call him the silent partner, <laughs> but you hear his music loud and clear through the songs he's written and produced. <laughs> Even background singer, I understand. <laughs> Sometimes, when I need to. <laughs> he is amazing, and he's from Indianapolis, okay? And that's what this interview is about today. We're talking to Daryl Simmons, who is, again, songwriter, producer. Is there anything you don't do? That is the question. Uh, <laughs> I don't perform. You don't perform? No, I would never perform. I did read something about background singer, though. Uh, I sing on some of the records that we've done. Sometimes okay. that you know we'll write a part, and sometimes the singer okay. can't quite... Okay get it and Kenny will say, go in there and sing it. She's not singing it right, so. But I sometimes don't put okay. my name down either. Now, I introduced <laughs> you as a silent partner. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody knows you work in conjunction with Babyface, L.A. Mm -hmm. Reid. Yep. So do you all work together? I, I know you still work with Babyface. With L.A. Mm -hmm. Reid, you still work? Is it always? No, L.A. moved into the executive field. Mm -hmm. You know, he was running Arista, then he went to Island Def Jam, and now he's starting his own company again. So we don't work directly in conjunction, but Kenny and I do. We're still songwriters like we were when we were kids. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's working on a new album. So I've been in, in LA working with him on okay. new songs. So okay. we'll always be songwriters together. Okay. So. so so take us back. You mentioned when we were kids. Take us back to when you were kids and, and how it all started. Um, you know, we played in bands when we were younger. That was big in Indianapolis. There were bands everywhere in different mm -hmm. neighborhoods when actually people played instruments and, mm -hmm. you know, and I played in a band, actually I played in a band with his brother. He had an older brother that played guitar. Okay. And, and you played? I played drums at the time. Oh, okay. I got a set of drums when I was nine and that's sort of how I got the bug of uh, okay. being a musician. I had played, actually played in a band with Kenny's brother, but we didn't have a singer. We just played instrumental songs and I had heard about Kenny. And I kept asking his brother, say, hey, why don't we get your brother? I heard about your brother can sing. No, we don't need to get him. So he kind of like, <laughs> he kind of like shunned and hated on him uh -huh. at a younger age. But finally, uh, he walked up one day with some other guys and I was outside where we rehearsed. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, so you're Kenny. I finally got to meet you. And from that day, we, were, we hit it off. He was 14, I was 15. Uh -huh. And from that day, 40 plus years later, we're still Still cranking them Still out. Still cranking them out. <laughs> trying to. <laughs> That's kind of how it started. We had various bands, local bands that we played in in the city. Back then, though, when, when you had the bands, uh, and I think now when we look back at that, we don't realize what a rich musical history that was for us. Mm -hmm. When you're in the thick of it, it's like, okay, it's a bunch of friends are getting together and recreating yeah. this music. But now it's just like the old jazz singing in Indianapolis yes. when you think about yeah. some of the artists. Yeah. You know, West Montgomery, you go, wow, oh, we yeah. had Miss, exactly. West Montgomery. Yeah, Montgomery here, yeah he was know? thriving. I yeah. think Billy Wooten, yeah. I remember that name. Yeah. Some names yeah. that I remember of guys that were really big when we were mm -hmm. just trying, we're in the garage trying to whatever do with what, yeah. what we were trying to do. Yeah. So yeah, it was big back then. So um, I saw a picture of you on Facebook mm -hmm. where you're at height, it looks like you're in the hallways of- High school, North Central. North Central. North Central High School, high school. 1975. Okay, now I did go to Broad Ripple. I just want you okay. to know that. We played for a dance at Broad Ripple. Oh, really? And we bombed. Oh, you, you bombed? Yeah, we were terrible. <laughs> Now, when you, when you say you bombed, what does that mean? What does that really mean? Well, they didn't like us. You know, we, we <laughs> thought we were kind of all that, and we got this big dance at Broad Ripple, and uh -huh. they didn't like oh, wow. us. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, so it just didn't, one of those gigs that <laughs> we That makes sucked. you try harder than... <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, we sucked pretty bad, so, yeah. But North Central, which, it, they, that is an amazing school, and, yes, and I is. hate to admit it, coming from Broad Ripple, but I run into so many people, like, oh, I went to Broad Ripple. I mean, I went to North Central, I'm like, mm -hmm. you too? And they're like, yeah, all great people. What were they doing to you people over there? I don't like, know, it's just, it's just a great school. It was a big school. Um, they had this uh, Jay Everett... A like career center mm -hmm. that was separate mm -hmm. from the school. And so I just remember it being almost like a college in a sense, be, you know, being there then. Uh, but it was, they offered a lot and uh, it was a great school. I had, I had a lot of fun there. And, you know, we sort of formed our musical really roots there as far as having a band and really working on music and saying, we're going to play music. Okay. And we didn't know what that meant, but there it was just like, because the kids made us feel so good that, oh, those are the guys that do music. Oh, those guys, they sing. They write their own songs. You're like equal to, to the basketball stars. You know yeah, how like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we were we were known at school. We were popular at school. Uh -huh. So that really juiced us to say, hey, you know, 
maybe, maybe we, we can, can do this. Maybe yeah. we can do this. Yeah, that's what you said know? in your picture on Yeah, Facebook, exactly, because the, and, yeah. and our friends were very supportive. The kids in high school were very, very supportive. And we mm -hmm. played at the dances, and like I said, they gave us so much confidence that we were like, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe this might be something, mm -hmm. you know, didn't know, but. So you know. when did it become something? Like, okay, you're playing in high school, and then mm -hmm. how did you transition, and where did you, tell us the story. Uh, played in high school, played a lot of proms and dances and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then once I graduated, Kenny was a year younger. So I kind of like, I say really goofed around for a year waiting for him to graduate. Mm -hmm. And I think I took a class, a music class at IUPUI just to be doing something. And then once he graduated, uh, we actually found another band. He was asked to be in a band called Manchild, which was a very yeah, big club remember. band. Mm -hmm. And the guys were older. And they were already established and they were really big in the club scene, which we were not. We just mm -hmm. played at dances. You know, we were the young suburb kids, played at the little proms and the parties, but they played in the hood, in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the club. Mm -hmm. So they had asked Kenny to join the band. So I was kind of out like, okay, well, what am I going to do? A few weeks later or a month later, they asked me, they say I snuck in the band. Okay. But someone asked me. That silent partner. Right. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I tagged along and that's where it kind of got really real. Mm -hmm. Because Manchild, there was a, a level of musicians that were there. Because uh, these guys were, they were really incredible. We, they were years beyond us as far as their mm -hmm. playing instruments and their knowledge of music. And so wow. that was sort of like an apprenticeship for Kenny and I to watch these guys. They were so seasoned and played so well. Who did you admire so much back then? Oh, it was uh, a guy named Reggie Griffin who started the group. And he just was this uh, musical virtuoso. He played sax, piano, guitar. Mm -hmm. And he just knew so much. He knew music. He was, he was like a young Quincy Jones. Oh, wow. You know, we'd get to rehearsal and he'd be recording. And he had played all the instruments. I'm like, how did you do that? He goes, well, I laid the drums first and I hummed it to myself. And then I went back. Uh -huh. I was like, wow. So he was the main person that we just gravitated towards, mm -hmm. uh, like a big musical brother. And you know, when we, we tried to do things, he would correct some of the things that we would do. Mm -hmm. uh, just a big, a huge influence uh, mm -hmm. on me. And, and record, even making records and recording a lot of the things that we learned from him. He was a major, but all the guys were great. They were great musicians, all of them, Bobby and Flash and AJ and Chucky who passed away mm -hmm. uh, a year or so ago. Just great, we were around great musicians. Okay. You know, really taught us a lot. So from Manchild on to what happened after that? What Manchild, we did a couple of albums and they were regional, mild success, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of petered out and Kenny actually left first. You know, once again, I was there, he left, and um, he actually went to a band in Michigan. Hmm. Uh, he played with a lo another club band in Michigan. He kind of got bored with what we were doing. But in between, we had made friends with a guy named Bo Watson, who played in a group called Midnight Star. Okay. Yeah. And they were from Cincinnati. They would come to Indianapolis and play in the clubs, along with another group called The Deal. They would come to Indianapolis, okay. only 100 miles away. So he started writing songs with Bo in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. uh, Midnight Star was working with a group called The Deal, okay. which we knew those guys as well. They asked Kenny to join The Deal. I remember that. After Kenny joined The Deal, they did an album. Kenny calls me, hey, you want to come along and be a player and write songs? I'll say, hey, absolutely. So they came and swooped me up from okay. Indianapolis, and I went to Cincinnati. Okay. And uh, that's where it really, really started as far as being really songwriters and becoming producers and making our own records and being behind the, the, the machine. Okay. You know, Ellie and Kenny started as producers first, producing the group. I was, still, I was a songwriter, uh, but I would sit there and watch them. I would sit on the couch, I would stay all night and just mm -hmm. sit and watch how they produced. Wow. You know, but I was writing, but as far as producer, I wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't a producer. And, and uh, tell us, because we hear writer, we hear producer, mm -hmm. but what a producer does now, I know how, like, how to produce a TV show, but I don't know how that same translates thing. into It's pretty music. much the same thing. The producer is, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and we're going <laughs> to get it done this way. You know, the, okay. the captain, the coach, this is, this is how we're going to do it. You know, and I was terrified of it, you know, in the beginning. I mean, I became a producer by default because Ellie and Kenny had so much work that they couldn't be at two places at once. And one night, we were working with Karen White and I was sitting on the couch right here and they were sitting at the console and Ellie's looking at his watch. He goes, he turns around and goes, you got to help us with some of this damn work. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, cause we got to go over here. And I think they were working with Pebbles. We got to go over here and work with Pebbles. You need to finish this. 
And I was like, well, I don't know what to do. He said, well, you've been sitting here all this time. He said, you know what to do? Just do it. And he and Kenny literally got up and walked out. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I was a nervous wreck. And I just, they threw me in the seat. And, you and I said, okay, out. what would they do? I've sat there for so many sessions. What would Ellie and Kenny do? This is what they would do. This is what they would do. And even still to this day, when I work, I go, what would Ellie say? What would Kenny say? Is it right? Kenny mm -hmm. goes, no, it's not ready. Ellie would say, nah, it's not ready. Uh -huh. And so I still use them as that gauge to okay. say, is it right? No, go back and check it. Okay, okay go check it again. You know, okay. and that's, like I said, I became a producer by default. I didn't want, I didn't want the responsibility, because like you said, that's what a producer does. You're responsible. Okay. You're responsible for the session. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And I got to bring it home and I, and I got to make sure that it's right. Because okay. I was Ultimately, thinking you could help me with the new theme song for Inside Indy on the show. But <laughs> I didn't know how that actually worked. Like, would I have to sing? You know? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's got to sing. Like? What's right. that going to look like? Somebody's got to sing it. You know, if I, if, if I write something, somebody's got to sing it. No, it won't be me. It won't be me. I don't do, I don't go that far. Wow. But, you know, so that's how it, that's really what a producer does. He, he pulls it all together and brings it home, pulls mm -hmm. all the people together. Wow. And I always tell people the greatest example of a producer, if you can remember, is when Quincy Jones did We Are the World. Mm. Okay, yeah. He was the producer. So you think about all the people that were involved, all the big stars, the egos. I think Quincy had a thing. That song up to right. like 50 ways, right? And I think right? Quincy said, hey, leave your ego at the door because everybody's not going to get to sing on this. This is how it's going to go. So to me, that's probably the greatest production job or an example of a producer pulling superstars together to pull a thing together where everybody's not going to get to shine. And that's, that had to be yeah. a heck of a job. Yeah. To do because even when you watch the video to, today, yeah. you'll go, Oh, there's such and such there. I there's didn't hear such. them. I yeah. didn't hear them, but they Speaking were in there. Them. But Quincy delegated, You're going to sing this, Ray Charles is going to sing this, Bruce Springsteen is going to sing this, Al Jarreau is going to sing this, okay. Lionel's going to sing this, Michael's going to sing this. Okay. That's a, that's that's the job. Okay, so then you're going to help me produce the new theme song for Inside Indy. We're going to take okay. a break, and when we come back, we'll have more <laughs> that's good. with Daryl Simmons. You've messed up your son's haircut. Do you try to fix it? Work with what you've got? Or show solidarity? Thank you, babe. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. back here on Inside Indy and we're talking to, we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Daryl Simmons, a Grammy Award winning songwriter, producer, you name it, he's done it all. And I'm just, I'm just, just outdone that you're here in the studio <laughs> with us. This is, this is so cool. Uh, and so many artists you've worked with. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's, let's talk about some of those people you've worked with. When I, you mentioned Tony Braxton earlier. Mm -hmm. um, uh, boys to men. I mean, countless, mm -hmm. countless artists. Yeah, um, when you produce those groups, how, how, that's the, the the layman doesn't understand what really mm -hmm. happens there. Or and say, for example, you're going to do something with Michael Jackson. How do you produce? How do you say anything to Michael Jackson? Because he's mm -hmm. Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of times, singers have the gift. You know, they have the gift and the talent, but mm -hmm. without direction. Sometimes maybe it doesn't um, blossom. And so it's sort of like a coach. A player has the talent, and then the coach says, hey, if you do this, you can be great. Wow, that's interesting. And so I look at it. I think sports and music are very parallel to me. Mm -hmm. um, so you take somebody like that, and you say, OK, you know, sounds great. You have a great voice, but let's use it this way. No, don't sing that there. Save that for later. So it's really it's more of guiding them through it to you to use their voice okay. in the right way to make it shine as a, I know I know you're incredible but don't sing everything that you know how to sing the very first chorus let's save a little bit for the third chorus and then let's save it for the end so it's really just giving them the direction and us knowing how the record should move how it should start and how it should end you know okay. Tony has a thing if you guys like it I love it okay because she trusts us <laughs> ah, and she trusts okay. that we know okay. what we're doing and it's going to be right and you know the track record. Because you pretty much catapulted her. her career. The songs we wrote, yeah, yeah, the songs we wrote, 
And I always say it's the artist and the songs. It's, it has to be that perfect marriage. And so those songs that we wrote in the beginning, oh. Breathe Again, Another Sad Love Song, Seven Whole Days, You Mean the World to Me, Love Should Have Brought mm. You Home, Give You My Heart, they were married perfectly with her voice. You know what I'm saying? So it has to be a marriage. Still just classic. Because it can still be a great song. When you're, read, it when you're saying it, I'm going, I can yeah. hear it in my head. So the songs, know? along with Tony, who has a still my favorite voice to record because I just mm -hmm. love her voice. It was the matching of her voice and the songs. I say, bring the songs to life. Okay, we wrote them. This is how they go. Now you bring it to life. Make it yours. Own it. Put your stamp on it. And that's what we look for as producers. Do something that I didn't do. Do something that Kenny didn't do on the demo. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for, what we call that magic. The just demo, mentioned, you happens. mentioned the demo. What's, what's the, the demo? The demo is like, you know, we'll write a song and usually Kenny will sing it down. Okay, I'll do a, do a track to show how it goes. Very quick, very rough and then give it to the artist. Hey, this is how it goes. Go home and learn it. Come back and we'll record. Okay. So that's, that's what it is. So what do they ever is. do, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. Do, do they ever do something that like, you have it in your head, it's one way, but the, mm -hmm. they do it differently and you go, ah. They do it differently, yes. I, I like that better. Yes, or, that's yeah. what we're looking for. That's why I said, make it yours. This is the way okay. I'm singing it. How would you sing it? How would Tony Braxton sing it? How would she phrase it? And of course, Tony's incredible and she does more than what is expected. That's why I love working with her because she just takes it and, Okay. Just takes it to new heights. So. But then you go sometimes like, no, don't, don't do. Yes, that. absolutely. No, stick to the melody. That was too fancy. Don't do that. Let's give the melody. Let's let people learn it first, and then we'll come off the melody, and you can do what you want to do. So once again, you're just guiding them. You know, no, don't shoot that three pointer. Pass it over here, and go for the easy bucket. Okay. okay. And we'll still get the, and we'll still get there. Okay. So it's that, like I said, it's really guiding the ship, and and navigating it and getting it from point A to point B, and hopefully at the end, it'll be successful. Was there anybody you wanted to work with that you haven't had a chance to or didn't get a chance to? Yes, I, I always, I wish that I could have worked with um, Marvin Gaye. Uh, that's one person I, I felt like the songs that we wrote would fit him, leaving a lot of songs that Kenny will sing. I was like, man, that's just, Sounds such like a Marvin kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. That's one person I wish I could have worked with. And I didn't get to work with Luther. You know, uh, I was close. Head, yeah. I was close, but I didn't get to work with him. Kenny worked with him, but I didn't get to work directly with him. I wanted to have written a song for him because I just thought his voice was just incredible. Oh. And I would have loved to have heard what he would have interpreted, you know, what we have written. Uh -huh. yeah. But yeah, those probably the the two that I didn't get to. But I worked with a lot of people I never thought I would, so okay. unfortunate. Now, you mentioned that, that Kenny had worked with him, but you didn't. So you don't mm -hmm. necessarily always work on everything together. Then. No, 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 no. Kenny, you know, will write and do things when he's in L.A. I live in Atlanta. I'll do things separately. And then the right project, he may call and say, hey, I need you to come out here and help me work on Drew Hill for Soul Food soundtrack. Okay. So, yeah, we're both okay. still working. Okay. Uh, and we only come together on certain things. So okay. he actually had written a song. I think every time I close my eyes for Luther, and Luther turned it down. Oh, that, and I okay. think Kenny won a Grammy for it. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and and you, you hear that that happens a lot, know. too, when people yeah, I think say, that's I turned the song, the song down. Maybe another one, but yeah. yeah, he turned it down. So that And that happens. People don't hear it sometimes. And now, that process of getting an artist to do your music, do you do you scout for people to, to do particular songs? or do you, And when you're writing it, do you have it in your mind, like, this is for whoever, yeah. Celine Dion, and you've got right. it in your head. That that's right. Yes, sure. if we get a call and somebody says, hey, we're looking for songs for such and such, mm -hmm. you go, okay. Then you go to work on something, formulating it for that person. Or sometimes you may already have a song and you can go, oh, you know what, I think that song may, that may work, that may work for him. Like I think Kenny had already written every little step before Bobby came along. Okay. And when wow. Bobby came along, I was like, yeah, Bobby can probably do every little step. And Bobby did. Did a great job, okay. great, once again, a great oh, marriage. Great, yeah. So that's usually what it is. I like to usually get the call to say, we're looking for songs for this particular person. So you can really craft it for that person. I really, I don't like to give a song and then try to sort of force it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We've done it, but I prefer to write it knowing that I wrote it for a person. And if they don't do it, you still know that it's good enough. You can still pin it on somebody else, although originally, it was written for this person. It still can be a successful song, mm -hmm. you know, and that's usually the process for Are people, us. artists clamoring to, to, to get to you to, because they think, okay, you're gonna make 
the next mm -hmm. big hit for me. Is not that, anymore. They used to. <laughs> now let's talk about that. Now, that what, is, what does the, that mean? Not I'm not the guy anymore. You know, I get my calls. I get uh -huh. a couple of calls. Kenny works way more than I do. He's an artist, so, mm -hmm. you know, he gets a lot of calls. I, you know, I pick and choose. I get a few calls a year for something. So, so, so you know. why do you think that is? And I have my theory on that. But well, music know. changes. You know, yeah, there's the, the new guy changes, that yeah. comes, just like singers. Whatever happened to such and such? Well, nothing happened to them. Somebody new came along, and they're just hot for the moment. Now it's Bruno Mars. Now it's this person. Nothing but, changes. It's just that the music changes in one sense, and then there's this new person that they gravitate towards. Well, you, know? you got rap. No. Got rap, which I, <laughs> I don't do rap and I don't know anything right. about. Totally I know what I like, but it's totally different. So a lot of things are rap driven, which are popular. So I don't do rap. People know that. They know what I do. They know what my career has been. I write ballads. You know, we, we write love songs. So that's what we do. You know, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I worked in radio for many years. Mm -hmm. I used to work with a guy, Bernie Egan, was a DJ. And we were mm -hmm. arguing one day on the air about whether he said, well, the Beatles, Paul McCartney hasn't done anything in a long time. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, and he looked at that like that was a failure. I said, after Let It Be, he didn't have to write another song he ever again. That's, I'm good. I'm good. So yeah. there's certain people who have written like that Stevie Wonder, Paul Stevie, McCartney, Paul McCartney, you know, the Beatles, uh, John Lennon. Uh, you know, <laughs> Daryl Simmons, uh, you know, Babyface. Kenny, yeah. I, as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned. Still doing it. Still doing it, but your stuff is, there's such classics that in my mind is not about a hit. It's about what you've written and it's, mm -hmm. it's, I agree. it's forever. Yeah, I agree. So I, I didn't understand why he, mm -hmm. as a DJ, could not appreciate that because yeah. I don't, I don't. I, yeah, I mean, like Kenny's show, people come to hear Whip Appeal. They uh -huh. come to hear As Soon As I Get Home. They come to hear, you know, what he's done. Mm -hmm. He may have new music, but they ain't necessarily coming to hear the new music. They'll listen to it, go, oh, mm -hmm. okay, that was nice, but we want to hear for the cool in you. We want to hear, when can I see you again? Mm -hmm. You know, so you're right. You sort of rest on what you've done. When those people come, that's really what they're coming to, you know, to hear. Yeah, we'd all like to have hit records again, and we're always writing and working on things. But at the same time, I always say that I'm very proud of what I've done. If I never have another hit record, I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? Because I, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we did do when it was oh, when it was in that in the prime of it. Yeah, it's a great catalog. So unbelievable, uh, unbelievable. And I think what happens a lot of times we don't know that, like when you're writing for other artists, that you mm -hmm. even did that. I'm some surprised right. sometimes. I'll read the label or go, oh right. my god, I didn't know they were behind that. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, a lot of records. There's a, there's a lot of records that you know we've done that people don't realize that we did do. Yeah. And we only have three minutes left. So uh, songwriting. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Where does it come from? Um, it just kind of comes. I say it just kind of falls from the sky. That's my See, my, not... my my synopsis of it or description that's... of it for me because you don't. It's like a painter that goes in a room with a blank canvas, and he just starts stroking. So I'll go to the piano and just what I call just tinkering. I'll sit there like this sometimes, and I'll sit like this sometimes. And then I might hit something and go, hmm, okay, that's interesting. Let me keep playing that little two-bar little piece. And then from that point, if I think it's worthy, um, then I'll say, okay, I think this is a good idea. And then I'll keep working that idea. And then, okay, that idea gets better. I say, I think this could be a record. Then I'll keep working the record. Okay, now what is the music saying to me? Hmm, what's it saying? So that's my process. That's mm -hmm. Kenny and I's process. Some people write from, Elton John writes from lyrics. Mm -hmm. You know, his partner, Bernie Taupin, will give him a set of lyrics and go, here's the song, Elton. And to me, that's really crazy. That's hard. I just, I think that's the harder way. But that's how it comes. It's just sometimes it can be inspirational. Somebody may say something. Somebody may be going ah. through something that you may hear just in passing. And you go, man, that's a really good title. I like that. We'll I've got a title for a song. What's that? Uh, if you do something wrong, do it right. I, I don't know. It, it's a country song, though. It's not like... Okay, a, yeah. it's a country you song. Do country. So it would be called Do It Right. To okay. shorten it, okay. it would be called okay. Do See, It Right. Okay, see, there you are producing me already. Right. So we're going to write, it. We're you gotta gonna write it this song. <laughs> you got to make it interesting and say, okay, what does that mean? Well, so many people do wrong things, and it's so stupid to me. Right. And, and so all the time on the radio, I, 
it, when I'd hear stories like that, mm -hmm. I'd go, if you're going to do something wrong, do it right. And I heard this country song in That's my head. That's a good head. title. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. I like that. I, That's a good idea. I'll have my people call your people. Okay, uh, cool. Oh, they're getting ready to go. No, you can't. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take an extra minute. A couple of quick questions. Okay. Um, wh what's it like to hear your music on the radio? Do, do you, when you hear it, like, um, do you go? It's, it's for me. That's the pinnacle for me, because I'm, I'm not an artist, so I don't do videos, I don't do performances. So for me, to hear my, my songs on the radio, is, it's gratifying because I know where that song was written, I know how I started it, or I know what we went through to get to that point. So to get it to the radio, is, that's the ultimate. So for me, it's a, it's a good feeling, you know what I'm saying, to, to hear that song that you wrote, even like maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I still hear songs that I, I'm very proud of the work that we did, it still stands up when I hear it. I'll pull up next to a car, maybe some girl singing mm -hmm. into the road as loud as she can. I'll just sit there and go. Yeah, I wrote that. Yeah, <laughs> I wrote that. And she's just, hey, baby, so that's, that's, that. that's yeah. my satisfaction. Right. Maybe for an artist, it may be the crowd, you know, right. cheering back. Yeah. One last question, I promise. Indianapolis, do you think we know, understand, and appreciate the work that you and Kenny have done? I think so. I think so. We always acknowledge Indianapolis. This was our learning ground. We never mm -hmm. forget where we come from. You know, we, we, we were aspiring kids, you know, rehearsing in a garage or in mm -hmm. somebody's basement in Indianapolis, you know, and it also lets you know that if we can do it, then anybody can do it, you know, because back then there was no social media. Nobody could see us. We didn't couldn't put something out there so somebody would see it. We had to do the work. We had to keep working and move to the next phase and move to the next phase. So, yeah, I think they do. Well, I hope the next time you're back in Indy, you'll stop by again. I will. Because I got more questions. I know, I got you. <laughs> I got lots part of two. questions. We'll do part I got two. lots of questions. Daryl Simmons, musical Oh, thank you so much genius. for having me. Thank Genial. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. For joining us here All on right, Inside Indy. And thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Join us at the Indiana Vision Expo, Saturday, September 11th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. People with vision loss, their friends, families, and service providers can find resources for independent living. Meet the talking book and braille staff. Get info on the Lux IQ lighting diagnostic tool and the latest from vendors like Bosma Enterprises, National Federation of the Blind, and Vision Aid Systems. Saturday, September 11th, 10 to 2 at the Indiana State Library. Park for 10 bucks at the Senate Avenue parking garage. This message from NFB Newsline, Indiana. Thank you.